Oh, there we go. Okay. We are live. Let's see. There we go. Yep. Here we go. Welcome to the Life Given Radio. Um, well, hold up. I'm getting ahead of myself. This is on the Life Given Radio Instagram live feed. Um, but this is the brief news brief. It is, sept- it is December 14th and we are in Moscow, Idaho. It's great to be here. I was sitting here for four or five minutes waiting until seven o'clock. I was, uh, we've got a lot to talk about today. We've got a couple people already joining. Um, shout out to my father-in-law and shout out to, uh, my wife. They are here. They are my support. Um, and my wife is waving. This is very good. We are off to a great start. Uh, we've got a few things that we can kick around first, unless other people have, uh, questions. We've, we can talk about how, how Joe Biden is now, uh, have enough electoral votes to be voted into office. The Electoral College met today and California put him over the top, uh, well over 270. Um, Then we could also talk about um, the Supreme Court saying uh, no to uh, the Texas suit. They didn't even give him a chance to speak in court. We could also talk about uh, this transgender uh, um, woman that came out and said that all children should be put on puberty blockers. And we can dissect what logic there might be there. But before we get into that, I do want to give a huge shout out uh, to listeners in California. You guys are um, very supportive out there. And in the last month, I think you've you've been the top state um, when it comes to listenership here um, on the Life Given Radio. So really appreciate what you guys are doing there. Um, And any any and all support is very welcome. Uh, And just you guys are in a very, very crazy state. Uh, So uh, prayers go out to you guys. Um, keep the course. Keep fighting the good fight, and uh, hopefully we can continue to produce more of this content that you guys, um, according to your listens, are enjoying. So, uh, whatever podcast you're listening to this on, uh, if you can't catch the live shows, uh, you can always catch this in the podcast format. So, uh, we're getting all the housekeeping stuff out. Don't worry, we're going to jump into the news briefing here in a moment. Uh, but we are going to try to Instagram live. Um, this show every single Monday, uh, it'll vary between seven and eight thirty PM Pacific time, but I will post across platforms to get that out. So if you miss it, um, it will be posted Tuesday morning. Okay. So, uh, we've got, um, oh, hello. We have three live listeners and that's record breaking right there. I think we broke two and Hey, you know, we're a small podcasting network here. Um, so I will take Hello, that's my sister. She just joined. Uh, go give her a follow at They Call Me Kaya. Um, she she's <laughs> very uh, very supportive of the show as well. Um, all right, let's get into it. Uh, you know, obviously, I think we can start off with uh, the Texas lawsuit, but everyone everyone's talking about that. And if you are still confused about what's going on, we'll get to that because there are a lot of ins and outs there and it's a little confusing, but really um, what the mainstream media uh, is uh, pushing right now, we can discuss. Um, oh, all right, sweet. The entire family's tuning in um, over there at the Shaw household. Okay, so um, Lauren McNamara, also known as Zania Jones, never... I've never heard of this person until I saw this report. Okay. Um, We're up to four followers. I'm going to keep shouting it out because it's cool. You know, it's interaction. I'll get better at this interaction later on. But uh, she, referring to Lauren McNamara, who's a transgender, tweeted out, if children can't consent to puberty blockers, which pause any permanent changes, even with the relevant professional evaluation, how can they consent to the permanent and irreversible changes that come with their own puberty with no professional evaluation whatsoever. She goes on, an inability to offer informed consent or understanding the long-term consequences is actually an argument for putting every single cis and trans person on puberty blockers until they acquire that ability. I just want to let that sink in. Does that sound logical to any of you people listening right now? Uh, I I think this is just a good testament 
to where our country is right now. And I've said this um, on previous news briefings, but it is very different um, when I actually get to talk to people right here. So uh, rather astounding to be uh, hearing about the logic that a lot of people are um, imbibing in these days. And it doesn't surprise me uh, to where we are next. Uh, the Cleveland Indians are dropping their nickname. Uh, so the Cleveland Indians are actually in uh, the... <laughs> uh, Chris Nias asks, are there stupidly blockers? Um, and I, I think we could use definitely use some of those in in today's uh, culture. So the Cleveland Indians are retiring their nickname um, because of the egregious and aggressive racism it commits on people, I guess. Um, so they announced that yesterday, or today actually, it's today on Monday, they are going to be changing their name. They will continue to uh, wear the moniker on the jersey this coming season, but they are searching for a replacement to the nickname the Indians uh, because it is um, offensive, apparently, to Native Americans. So we, we have gotten to the point where we are a advocating for um, all of our children to be on puberty blockers until they can make their own decision when it comes to whatever gender they want to be. And we are also at the point where a name, okay, that really was created out of respect for a certain people group is now offensive. <laughs> well, they called them the Cleveland of baseball team. Um, <laughs> obviously referring to the Washington football team, uh, which, which is, <laughs> just just another um, crazy thing that has happened in 2020. Um, now, my, my question is, are we going to listen to all women? Uh, there, there was the Me Too movement that swept through our culture uh, in the last few years. And recently, um, you know, I, I think actually before we get to that, it culminated with our uh, um, one of the justice appointments that President Trump made, and that was Kavanaugh, right? And he just, his entire name and family got dragged through the mud through hours and weeks and months of hearings that took a long time to culminate, right? For him to actually be vindicated of these very malicious accusations. Um, so I want to, what the story we're going to cover, I want to be taken with a grain of salt. I don't want to jump in and accuse people um, without waiting for um, due process, right? Um, our, our culture could use more due process and more patience, and I would like to exhibit that. So take this with a grain of salt, but I do want to report on it. So Lindsay Boylan uh, served as a deputy director for economic development and special advisor to the Cuomo administration. He's the governor of New York, and it's been, um, yeah, his, his state has been a hot mess. That's for sure. Um, so she comes out and she accuses Governor Cuomo of sexual harassment. She she tweeted about this. So this is not, you know, like a, a statement to the police. This is not in court. Um, so once again, be aware, cancel culture is a thing. We don't want to incite any of that. But uh, I know, thankfully, all the people here listening live <laughs> uh, would not do that. Um, and I can testify to that unless... I don't know. Maybe maybe someone has had a bad Monday. Anything could happen. Anyway, so uh, she tweets out, uh, yes, the governor Cuomo sexually harassed me for years. Many saw it and watched. I could never anticipate what to expect. Would I be grilled on my work, which was very good, or harassed about my looks? Or would it be both in the same conversation? This was uh, the way of it for years, apparently. Um, she goes on to say, I'm angry to put to be put in this situation at all. That's because I am a woman. I can work hard my whole life to better myself and help others and yet still fail and still fall victim as countless women over generations have, mostly silent. I hate that some men like New York Governor Cuomo abuse their power. So hopefully due process will be carried out. And if she has suffered these things, that uh, there will be judgment brought down on Governor Cuomo. Now, let's get to 
I mean, this is probably the meat of any episode that's going to be discussed in the last week. Um, Texas, as we reported on Friday morning in our news briefing, uh, they they sued uh, four different states and took it to the Supreme Court. Uh, and we'll get to what they were alleging in their suit here in a moment. But that's what I reported on on Friday. But then we got to Friday afternoon, you know, 12 hours after I release it. And the Supreme Court, you know, uh, I think out of a lack of respect for this podcast and just allowing for uh, people for it to not become too dated, um, they they tossed the case without allowing it to have hearing. Um, and and um, secession talk is starting to circulate uh, pretty heavily. Now it's been slammed by many different uh, mainstream media outlets, but I think um, you're going to start hearing more of this talk if we don't see uh, proof or at least... Um, once again, due process. That, that, that will probably end up being the title of this episode, uh, whether or not due process will be carried out in these allegations. Will they even get a chance in court? Um, because a lot of these uh, accusations have been tossed from court. So uh, the crux of the Texas case, and I'm just going to read this from an article that I read through right before. Um, uh, the crux of the Texas case was the argument that the four states it is suing all four of which was swung for President-elect Joe Biden, unconstitutionally changed their election statutes in their judiciaries or executive branches. When only the legislator is allowed to make election law, um, so it goes on, uh, Texas asked this court to recognize the obvious fact that defendant state's maladministration of the 2020 election makes it impossible to know which candidate garnered the majority of lawful votes. The court's role is to strike unconstitutional action and remand to the actors that the Constitution and Congress vest with authority for the next step. So in summary, also shout out to my brother-in-law. He is joined. Uh, we've gotten up to six attendees. What's that? Oh, Abby. Ruth, Ruth has acknowledged. So shout out to my family. They are holding down the fort. I appreciate this. This is awesome. Um, and that's uh, Moscow and Minnesota. So uh, California, you got to step up your game. Where are you guys right now? Um, maybe you can only listen to uh, the podcast, but we are closer to your time zone. Anyway, to sum it all up, basically the allegation is that if we are having faulty elections in other states, and uh, which allows for fraudulent votes to be cast at a high rate, you're watering down all of the votes. Okay. So what would have happened if Texas had been able to get their day in court, right? If they had been able to get their day in court and been able to overturn the election, that would have swung it from Biden to Trump and we would have had a, a recount at the very least in those states. Instead, the Supreme Court sends it back saying that there was not enough standing for this. Um, now, here, here's where um, things are starting to get sticky. Um, 17 red states weighed in favor of Texas, while 20 states and territories back Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, Michigan, and Georgia. Okay, so that means almost, almost an even split. There were also states that tried to join the Texas suit. So there's, there's a step beyond saying I'm with this state. Right, they wanted to join the lawsuit, and that's our home home state, Missouri, uh, as along with five other states, uh, tried to step in um, and support what Texas was doing, but that was not enough. And say good night, right? We're we're out. Um, and uh, the Republican chairman in Texas was not having it. He he was very fed up with it, and even put out a statement saying that uh, perhaps law-abiding states should bond together and form a union of states that will abide by the Constitution. This is coming from the chair of the Republican Party in Texas, okay, um, which has been predominantly a very, very Republican state. Now, we're starting to see it swing a little bit, but still strongly Republican. Now, as I mentioned earlier in the show at 
today, on Monday, we have gotten the Electoral College has met and Biden has garnered enough, garnered, not gardened, uh, he has garnered enough electoral votes to win the presidency. And that, I, I don't want to read in too much to um, what, what Trump and his administration may be reacting to these things, but a report came out from the Daily Beast that um, they may be starting to realize the futility of their efforts. Uh, so the campaign in North Virginia um, headquarters, which is supposed to be kind of like where the legal battle is centered, like that's their headquarters, um, has apparently been virtually emptied out. So this report still has to be verified, but it came out today that it is basically a ghost town. Um, an inside source for the Daily Beast told the reporter that it's basically a ghost town. Um, a lot of the Trump pin signs have been stripped from the walls of the headquarters in Ar Arlington, Texas, uh, Arlington, Virginia. Uh, the, text, uh, the desks and memorabilia have been largely packed, thrown out, uh, and removed from the office spaces. Uh, staffers' belongings are even more thoroughly cleared out. Um, and then there's a voter fraud hotline room. And that had been like, th like the phones were going off the hook for days on end. But since people have cleared out because it's mostly just prank callers, um, is this is this a sign of things to come? Saying that Trump, you you're completely um, out of it, and that it, it will be interesting to see uh, if that's the case. But Trump continues to uh, you know sound the battle alarms. We are not done yet. Uh, Rudy Giuliani on his legal defense uh, hopped on and said, you know, this is not. This is far from over. We're still, we still have um, other legal cases that are in court elsewhere. Now, also, shout out to uh, a listener that just joined. Um, that brings us up to seven. Seven is our highest yet. I'll take it. That's awesome. Um, so one of the things that I think might have uh, scared the Supreme Court from taking the Texas lawsuit was the fact that it took so dang long to get it to court. Uh, I'm, I'm surprised at how slowly the Republican Party um, and the Trump administration moved. If they really had all of this, this evidence, like they said they had, then why didn't they get to court as quickly as possible? Because we only have so many days till the Senate and the House of Representatives meets to ratify what the electoral votes were cast today. I, I think it's mid-January. Okay, time is running out. And the Electoral College met today. And we just now brought it into courts on Friday. So uh, I, I don't know. I'm curious to hear what you guys have to say in the live chat. I mean, do you think that it's too late for Trump? Um, was there ever a chance for him to uh, even have a shot at uh, you know overturning the election? Um, because it seemed like there's plenty of fishy things going on. Uh, but I'll field some questions or some comments that you want me to say on air uh, before before we log out here. But this is where we're going to – my reporting ends and we can have some discussion to begin here. I've pulled my weight, guys. I had a show prepared for you. And like I said in past shows, this is open for – uh, comments and we can have some interaction. But first of all, thank you so much for everyone being here. Um, Abby says she thinks that Donald Trump has shot. I agree. I mean, obviously, like you'd probably be able to expound on that more in person, but I think he had his chance and I agree with that. I, there, there are only so many days in the year and um, 2020 was not Trump's year. I think he let a lot of things get away from him. You know, he just, Barr just now resigned. I believe that's the AG there. He just now resigned. Um, he should have gotten Barr a long time ago, gotten rid of him a long time ago. Um, same with Fauci, same with Burks. If you are working against your own administration, a house divided cannot stand. Why, why would you expect to succeed if you don't set yourself up for success? Uh, Micaiah laughs well she 
she says that I think he had a shot if other people had the courage to stand up to the cheating parties. Ooh, okay, there we go. That that's an interesting comment because I think that um, hmm. I mean, because, yeah, he, he definitely has been very outspoken. Um, and that's what Kip and I discussed on the Cut in the Dry at the very beginning of our show. Um, he definitely has the guts to stand up um, to the people. Uh, but I really think that he could do it in a better way. Uh, I think that if he uh, had been slightly, I don't know, more wise in the way that he communicated, he might have been able to win over some win some people like Kaylee McEnany, Right. Um, so Kaylee McEnany is his press secretary, very eloquent, right? Um, I think if he had more of those kinds of people in his camp, might've had better, um, yeah, no, the court systems. Well, now Micaiah, that's interesting because, uh, he appointed how many justices was it to just like circuit benches? I think it was 300. Um, my father-in-law, Chris says, speculate uh what would happen in four years given trump succeeded in the court versus the election um standing as is uh okay so four years from now i think i understand this question and you can get on the phone with me and uh (laughs) correct me after this but i think that um if trump was able to successfully overturn it I honestly don't know what would happen. Um, Same with, you know, just 2021 through 2024, 25 is going to be such a weird, weird time to be in the United States. Because if Trump overturned the election, you still have 70 million some people that, I mean, they work their darndest to get him out of office in the last four years. Imagine what they would do if they had another four years of Trump. Uh, I mean, they never conceded the election to him uh, in 2016. Why would they uh, fight, you know, with less vitriol in the next four years? Now, if Trump won or or if Trump loses, like I, I expect him to because of all the information that's come out, um, I think that the losing party, either, you know, Republicans, Christians, conservatives, all those people that will be in the 75 million that voted for Trump but lost. Uh, I think we're a little bit more gracious losers than uh, the other side. But I think we need to start taking a hard look in the mirror. Um, I Well, we're beyond this point. But being able to say, um, speak more confidently about what we believe in. Because really, liberals and Democrats are much more politically active and have just had the run of the mill. Um, and w- we've allowed them to run unopposed. So... Um, yeah, I think I think we need to. <laughs> My wife says that she's not feeling very gracious. That's fair enough. Um, also, I, I'm sure that if I weren't on live right now, I would be a little less uh, less gracious. <laughs> anyway, that that is an interesting speculation. Uh, whether or not uh, the country would be different. Um, no, we. I don't know if I'll share that comment. <laughs> my my sister says i don't know where you get the molotov cocktail ingredients but that's just because she doesn't know where to get them um any more comments this has been really fun it's kind of cool to get some live interaction normally most of my shows are very scripted um and i do a lot of research on them beforehand but uh winco oh yes no don't point her there <laughs> but Micaiah, you need a mask to get into Winco. Uh, and I know you're one of those silly people that don't get on Winco uh, or don't mask up to go into Winco. There we go. So obviously you can't go in at all. Yep, fun DIYs is coming soon. We've got some fun things in the can for 2021. Um, Danny Bradley is – I'll go ahead and just uh, kind of shift over to some fun announcements. Danny Bradley is – uh, shooting his first episode uh, this Thursday. Um, and then we're in the works with a couple other people to get a few more podcasts on the network here in 2021. Um, any closing thoughts? Uh, we'll go ahead and wrap up there. Um, thanks for everyone for tuning in. This was awesome. Um, really good, good way to end my Monday. I've been 
uh, consumed with thesis defense. So it's good to just like get a break. Um, and kind of gone on a little longer than I normally would go, but this was fun. Um, yeah, like and share the show. I know all of you guys are very loyal, um, but any share really goes a long way to just get get outside the uh, the bubble of listeners that we have, um, and and give us feedback on what how we're doing. Whether it's the cut and the dry, um, myself with the news briefing, or Danny with his new podcast coming on, um, we'll close there. All right. So remember that the life that you've been given and the life that you've received includes every area of life. Current events, this dumb election cycle is no exception. God bless, Merry Christmas, and I will talk to you guys on Friday.